Okay. So welcome to this diversity and inclusion dialogue session from the Global Alliance for Public Relations and Communications Management. We are elated and honored to have two diversity and inclusion champions with us today for this session, Dr. Rochelle Ford, APR, and Adana Anderson. And we're gonna hear a little bit about both of them because if I tell you guys uh, their vast expertise and experience uh, professional experience will be here from five to 10 to 15 minutes talking and talking about these two champions. So Viviane, please move along. Dr. Rochelle Ford APR is a higher education leader, diversity, equity, and inclusion expert, a leading public relations professional, researcher, author, and an international speaker. She's at the time Dean of the Elon University School of Communications in Elon, North Carolina. And Dr. Ford also is a 2021 Page Distinguished Service Award honoree who has received numerous accolades, including PRSA National Capital Chapters Diversity Champion Award and PRSA's National D. Park Gibson Multiculturalism Award, among others. In two, 2014, she was inducted into the Arthur W. Page Society. What a true champion. Let's see a little bit about Adana Anderson, who is joining us today as well. Adana is Head of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging at High Wire PR since 2020, where, when she joined the agency. She's focused on BPOC talent recruitment, innovating agile retention and career enhancements initiatives, diverse creatives and for diverse creatives and story so storytellers, I'm sorry. She's leading the agency's DIBs council and evangelize, evangelizing the, uh, the agile retention and mission journey an award-winning public relations practitioners and diversity, inclusion, and equality strategist. Ajana was named 2022 Woman of Distinction by PR Week. She is also a transformational and results-driven leader with an aptitude for advancing cultural change initiatives, while also an, adju an adjunct ethnic studies professor with an emphasis on African-American studies at Laney Community College in Oakland, California. Wow, ladies, what an honor to be talking with you today. Adana was interested in getting to know Dr. Ford as well. So we're having the opportunity to talk, to have a dialogue about your experiences, your views, your perspectives, on diversity, inclusion, and equality. And I want to start this conversation by uh, getting to know you a little bit better. How about your education, your upbringing, your life experiences to get to the position that you are right now? You are both diversity and inclusion champions. Uh, do we uh, begin with Dr. Ford to get to know her a little bit better besides what we know in her bio and her life experiences, Dr. Ford. Well, thank you so much for, for hosting this event, the Global Alliance. I really appreciate all the work that the Global Alliance does to bring practitioners from around the world together so that we can move our industry in a very ethical, action-oriented way. And at the end of the day, operating in the best interests of our publics, which really at the heart of it involves inclusion. And my own life journey was, was that, is learning how to navigate so many different environments and, and communities. I was raised in a small town, a suburb um, of Columbus, Ohio called Gehanna. So I like to joke and say, if you can say banana, you can say Gehanna. Well, it wasn't the bastion of diversity. I was one of the few African-American um, children, you know, in my school, K through 12, um, you know, even fewer Asian Americans. And I don't know who, if anyone even identified with being um, 
part of the Latinx community or um, Native American community. So we, we, it was not very diverse. And at the same time, from that time, I've always wanted to have that sense of belonging. And I found that when I journeyed as an undergraduate to Howard University, a historically black college, where for the first time I wasn't questioning if I was exceptional or accepted just because I was black. Did I get that award because they needed a black representative? Did I get that position? I was always questioning myself, um, but I was around professors, PhDs, you know, uh, medical practitioners, attorneys, um, and talking about the African-American experience was just a normal part of our conversation. It wasn't a, a, an emphasis in February only or an emphasis when you talked about slavery and civil rights. It was every subject from math to biology to um, journalism communications. And I finally felt like I had a place where I could bring my whole self um, and not question my own identity. And I wanted that experience to be something that everyone, no matter what someone's sexual orientation is, no matter what someone's um, nationality is, et cetera, that they too could bring their whole selves to any environment and be able to contribute, um, whether they're entry level or the CEO, that um, building of communities and inclusive place is something that I want to do. I like to say that what helped me get here is curiosity. I love to ask questions. That's why I study journalism from scholastic journalism to a PhD and really loving to have other, feed other people's curiosity, which is why I became a teacher um, and also feeding um, and helping to support others in their professional journeys. And so I went into academia um, and climbed, you know, I want to say climbed, but, you know, when you have talents and you're great at problem solving, you get asked to do more service. And that led me into um, administration. Sometimes though, I think faculty have the best life ever to do teaching and research and not have to solve too many problems. Um, so I guess to sum my career up and, and my interest, it really started off with that sense of wanting to always build communities where people can bring their whole selves to work and feel like they can contribute without second guessing or people second guessing them. Um, but also um, the idea of curiosity, I always wanting to learn about others, wanting to grow and wanting to help people on their own personal journeys. Perfect. And we share that curiosity has driven my, myself, my personality and my professional career as well. Adana, please share with us a little bit about you so we can understand your, your development and your achievements in mm -hmm. life. Well, just want to say hats off to you, Dr. Ford, inspired by your story. And Gladys, thank you and the Global Alliance for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. And in, I was struck by Dr. Ford's um, narrative because in many ways, my childhood trajectory is very opposite of that in that I grew up on the South side of Chicago. I grew up, I'm a child of the 70s. I and all of my siblings were given African names. We were in a very Afrocentric household um, with a lot of HBCU alumni in our families. And so the expectation was like Black excellence always, right? Like you can do whatever you want to, you're African kings and queens. And um, just a sense that like the world is yours for yours to take and to really um, feel empowered. And so I went to another HU myself. I went to Hampton University. Um, and that is the same HBCU that my great grandmother attended. And um, I was so kind of inspired by where I was a hundred years after, you know, her time there, because at the time that she attended, the expectation was though she was in a college setting that she would become a domestic. And my great grandmother was very much a rebel and wanted to be an educator. You know, she's like, I'm here to be a teacher. I'm not here to be a domestic. So I came through as an English major. And at the time um, of, of my graduation, I sort of envisioned my career being in academia. So I went to grad school for African-American studies with an emphasis on Black women's literature until, wow. I had to write, until I had to write that master's thesis. And then I was like, hold up, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> I got to get off this train. And so from there, making that pivot, 
Um, I ended up working in public relations and marketing really organically. I went back to Chicago. I started working for some healthcare organizations. Then a light bulb went off for me. And I was like, I can use those same skills of loving to write, of loving to be creative, of loving to do community engagement and bring them into the PR field. So joined Black Public Relations Society in Chicago. And as I think people of color are want to do, felt that I had to go back to grad school to prove that I'm... Um, eligible and worthy to be in this shift. So went back to graduate school, this time for public relations. I went to Syracuse and I noticed the disparity of representation right there in grad school. Um, I was like looking around my class and I was one of two black women um, in the class. And I, and I remained very good friends with my classmates um, to this day and especially my one um, other sister friend. And um, when I interviewed, Again, I was just struck, and this is in New York City, this is in Washington, D.C., I was just struck by, you know, looking at agencies, how little representation there was, mm -hmm. and I was sort of caught in this conundrum because at the, the thinking at the time was like, if you want to be in PR, and if you want to do corporate communications, which is what I wanted to do, the advice was, you've got to get that agency experience, you've got to get it, like it's a must, so I moved to the Bay Area after graduating and I had an internal job as a public information officer, but I kept my eye on the prize of wanting to do agency work. And then I ultimately landed at an agency. And in many ways, it was the best of, it was sort of the best and worst at the same time because skill wise, it was phenomenal. Like I totally, once I was in it, I got why everyone felt that this experience was critical because you do have those rapid response skills you know, we're working, I was working with tech and healthcare clients and just like the team dynamic, um, you know, working with executives, like just really elevating, right? Beyond anything I could have imagined in graduate school. So on the one hand, it was really, and it was glamorous, like doing a media tour in New York and being in DC and talking to folks at Reuters and Wall Street Journal, like it was very sexy, very glam. Uh -huh. There was a downside to that which was here in this agency, and this is like, you know, 10 plus years ago, very often I was the only black woman in the whole company. Wow. Um, when there were some times when I had other, you know, black folks kind of filtering through, if they were in a higher position, it wasn't like, I'm here to look out for you. And like, I can be your person and you can confide in me. And I want to pour into your career. It was more like, okay, well, um, it was just like, there was more of a competitive since I didn't, my agency experience was not about bringing my whole self to work. It was like fit in, oh, shift, uh, please shift, adapt. make everyone comfortable. And your you job have is to make adapt. Correct. And so uh, that for me was very, I felt like I had to dim my light. I felt like I had to be so mindful of everything coming out of my mouth. And did I use the right words? And was I erudite today? And was I eloquent today? And just all that pressure to be. And, and PR is already a high pressure environment. But when you yeah. add the sort of underrepresentation piece of it and, and the weight you feel that if I mess this up, you know, <laughs> it's on me. Who's it's coming after me? So it's interesting. I ended up staying on the PR agency side for about six years, but I will tell you this, when I ultimately decided that to leave my soul intact, I had to leave, right? And I had two young children under the age of four when I decided to like make a, another pivot and I went over to the nonprofit side. When I left it, even though it was the right thing for me to do at the time for my family and for my career, I blamed me. I didn't blame the societal and systemic inequities and the barriers that really prohibited me from fully thriving. Oh. My sort of coping was like, Ayana, you just don't have what it takes. And I would agonize about that. Like how many of your ancestors have been in you know, situations where the, they're the only ones. And this is like, this is an experience for a lot of people of color that you have to be the trailblazer and it might be lonely and it might not be affirming, but it's important that you sit in the seat and then I was like, but I hated that seat, <laughs> right? I didn't like that seat. And so I lamented about it. And then when I had the opportunity to come back into the agency side in the seat of a diversity champion, because by this time I had also started teaching ethnic studies. So it was like this wonderful sort of redemption, I think for the, for the industry and for me to like be able to be that voice and to know what it's like to be that account person, to know what it's like to be bypassed for a promotion, even though you, you're coming in the door with however many degrees. Like, I know that lived experience. So I really feel like it has equipped 
me to really have an authentic way of, of advocating for folks who share my same lived experience. Wow. So now, now that I'm in a scenario where literally, I mean, I can have these like very, you know, wonderful conversations that are authentic. I don't have to feel like I can't use certain phrases because people might not get it. You can I be you. Really, you can I be can really be me. Yes. Yes. Wow. So it's, it's been a blessing. You know, wow. one thing I love that you, that you just shared is that so often we approach, let's bring in people. We know that diversity is important. Let's bring in people who are from different races, genders, ethnicities, what have you. But then we make them assimilate into the culture. So we rob them of wow. that piece of identity that makes them um, different and that way of thinking. And we mold them so that we all have assimilated into the same thing. And that's the opposite of getting the benefit of diversity. Diversity is you bring yourself with all of your quirks from your you know, socialization, how you were raised, where you went to school, where you've traveled, et cetera. You bring those experiences. And when you look at a problem, members of your team are gonna look at that problem completely different from because different somebody might see, right. They might see class issues going on. Someone else might see, you know, regionality things. Other people might see, you know, political things because we all are gonna approach it problem solving right? And that's what we do in PR, right? Not only are we managing the communication, but communication only goes so far. You have to get to the root of the problem, get to the root of the relationship. And if everybody went to the same college, mm-hmm. right? Because I, I, I love Syracuse. You know, I taught at Newhouse. Like, you know, it's an amazing place. I was the chair of the public relations department there. But if we only go to Syracuse and recruit, and we don't go to Dillard University where I'm now um, the incoming president of um, down in New Orleans, you're not going to get diversity of thought if you force my Dillard students to act like the Syracuse students. We don't want that. We need people to see things and bring themselves to look at problems differently because there may be underlying things that only someone from a different background might be sensitive and nuanced enough to even begin to identify. But too often we force people to assimilate. And it's like, if you're gonna work at this company, so I think back to the eighties and the seventies when women were just coming into the workforce. And I used to, we, my dad worked for AT&T then. And all the women had the white shirts with the blue blazers with a little string tie because men wore ties. And so the women had to be little men Wow. But that's not the beauty of feminization of the workforce. It's not for women to act like men, right? Wow. And so we have to change the structures and the systems. And that's what, Ayana, that's what you're doing now. You're like, let me not only coach people of how to navigate this crazy system, but now look at job descriptions and make sure that people from diverse backgrounds feel empowered to apply to them, look at the way we onboard people, let's look at how we are offering benefits so that people don't feel bad about taking maternity leave or paternity leave, right? Or saying, I need a mental health day because I'm a dog owner and I'm going to spend some time with my dog. Like inclusion, make sure that we, um, we look at the system and structure so that it is equitable treatment. So that it's not just a pipeline of bringing people in, but helping them to stay, helping them to do what they do best, helping them to be developed professionally and making sure that when people go up for evaluation, you don't misunderstand my pattern of communication as being arrogant or mean or off-putting because I don't look at you in the eye. Maybe I was culturally trained not to look at people in the eye. Managers need to learn how to be a culturally competent, proficient to recognize that some people don't stand close to you because it's a sign of respect. Other people stand close to you because it is a sign of respect. You know, so people have to be nuanced when they get their evaluations done, because so many people don't understand cultural differences and cultural communications. They expect it when they go abroad, right? People get that when I go to Mexico, things are gonna be different. When I go to China, things are gonna be different. And when I go to Italy or down to South Africa, 
they expected across country lines. But that same expectation that we have when we do business overseas or in different countries, we have to have that same expectation when we do business inside our domestic offices. Exactly. I, I, you said something very, very interesting. And we do not, we cannot fill the blanks. We cannot uh, limit ourselves to fill the blanks. That's not that what diversity, inclusion, and equality is. It's not, let's have three Latin American executives. Let's have two or three from Asia Pacific. Let's have five uh, from the black community. It's not filling the blanks. It's allowing everybody's vision and perspectives and insights to count, giving everybody a voice giving everybody the opportunity to grow and to be listened and to be taken care. And it's not only to listen, it's to put that insights into action. Right. I'm glad you said that. If I can weigh in too, because at Highwire, what has been so joyous for me has been really linking arms with everyone who's involved with our Dibs Council. And I want to be clear that at Highwire, Everyone at the agency has an expectation that one of your key performance indicators will be connected to the work of DEI. So that's across the board. But we do have this council that we work with. And, you know, for us, it's not just about developing and deepening and strengthening our allyship muscles on behalf of us as an agency, but also as it relates to the way that we engage with clients. So, like, if you're experiencing harm with a client, and people on your team are not standing in for you and standing up for you, then that's problematic. And we all know how dicey that is because, I mean, we are in client services, right? And so we have the expectation that we want to maintain these great relationships. But just as an example, because we are getting close to June, and I'm reminded of what we did last year, which was we had a panel with the PRSA chapter in Silicon Valley, and we had a discussion about Black women and hair in the workplace. And we titled it the emancipation of black women in our hair and people were like <laughs> how does that relate to Juneteenth excuse me we we're talking about freedom but it came out of a situation with a colleague who's young she's Gen Z she loves to change her hair and so she might have box braids this week a blonde pixie the next week I mean she's super creative and as part of her artist like expressing her you know hair um artistic you know vision her client contact sort of became obsessed with her ever-changing hairstyle. And in the beginning, she was like, okay, all right, yes, like, yes, I did a box braids, blah, blah, blah. But it became like appreciation sort of morphed into like a microaggression, right? Because oh. then it was like every week on the team call, the client was like, let's talk about your hair. And she oh. had all this unwanted attention. And I don't think the client contact was aware that like there's a deep, long history of like a complicated history about black women, black folks in the workplace, but specifically black women in hair. Um, I'm reminded of what you said, Dr. Ford, about the 80s and, you know, having to, you know, sort of have this look of the tie. Uh -huh. And I think for a lot of black women, it's like you got to have permed hair to be considered professional. And now there are more and more professionals who are electing to have natural hair. Exactly. So it became a conversation where we not just talked about this one scenario, but we had an elevated conversation around hair discrimination in the workplace. There's a Crown Act. There's a campaign with Unilever and Dove and a bunch of other brands that are sort of really unpacking this deep, complicated history of Black women and hair in the workplace. So it was a very enlightening, not just for our high wire community, but externally, we invited all of our clients to come too, because the awareness needs to go beyond, right? Exactly. The amen corner. We got to get out to the clients as well. So um, we're always just trying to push and to just bring these conversations forward because it might seem trite. Like people are like, I literally hesitate to get on this webinar. Like, why are we talking about hair? And it became a whole deep thing. And they were really glad that they attended. So, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you said we we're going to be a conversation and it's, we keep it's okay. going back and Go forth with each other. Go ahead, but, Dr. Ford. But I, I, I think that one of the key things that you said is about accountability and your team has to have key performance indicators. But one of the things that has hurt our industry from moving forward is clients not holding their agencies accountable. Exactly. All agencies 
tend not to do things because it's the right thing to do. They do things because they are forced to do. So if clients say, I will not keep you as my agency of record if you haven't increased the number of Latinx, you know, um, practitioners or Asian practitioners, or you actually start tracking how you're recruiting and retaining um, diverse talent, then guess what? A lot of agencies won't do it. Uh Um, And so one of the things that I'm excited about um, still is the Diversity Action Alliance. And the Diversity Action Alliance is people made a public pledge, not just to, you know, be an advocate for diversity um, and, you know, an ally um, and to do programming, but to share their data to be public and say, I'm going to share my data. So Elon University, I'm currently Dean, we were one of the first colleges that said, track us in higher ed, right? Wow. We ask people to hold us accountable. So if you go on to Elon's website, you will see our annual report on diversity, equity, inclusion. So you can see how we're striving towards inclusive excellence. And it's kind of embarrassing because we're not perfect, but we're on a journey. And that's the key thing is that you have to be transparent that you're on a journey and show what you've done and show where you want to go. But Everybody has to hold each other accountable. And it's not just a numbers game, but how many organizations have done a climate study? Do we know how our employees feel? And can we segment it according to gender identification? Can we segment it according to sexual orientation? Can we segment it according to a whole host of things, social economic level or educational background, et cetera? And do people feel included? And if they don't, if they don't see where they're headed in their own leadership journey, right? Or their career progression, what are we doing to help fill those gaps? But if we don't do our homework and actually ask, we could be having sessions and programs about issues that's not a problem. Exactly. Exactly. Could you could you share with us, Dr. Ford, um, in your university at the time, Ellen, um, if the curriculum reflects diversity, inclusion, and equality as a subject that is studied, promoted, the values for them to later become professionals who are educated on those values to include it at their executions, at their day-to-day. Yes, so Elon has always had that commitment and it has been one of our core values. We have something called the Elon 11. And the Elon 11 are the values and competencies that all of our students need to possess by the time they graduate. And number five, right there center is um, domestic and global diversity. So we've had that commitment ever since we've been accredited. However, all universities that are accredited by the Accrediting Council for Education, Journals and Mass Communication, not only do you have to say it is something you value, but you have to demonstrate it in several ways. And so Elon now is on the journey to get better at this. So one of the things that all programs who are accredited now have to demonstrate is how they are developing culturally proficient communicators. So if you're gonna produce that in your students, guess who also has to be culturally proficient? the faculty, because they have to teach people how to be culturally proficient. So we're having to look into our curriculum to see if we are doing reporting and writing assignments that are going to get people out of their comfort zone and, and report on and do research about people who are different than them. And how are they going to tell stories about people and issues that are different than them and tell them well so we can avoid the microaggressions or stereotyping or other types of biases and things that oftentimes creep in. They need to know about the Maynard Institute's you know, fault line research, You know that these are the fault lines we tend to trip over or we tend to neglect when we're doing wow. storytelling. But then in addition to being required to make sure that the students and the faculty are culturally proficient, we now have a requirement that every university that is accredited um, for journalism and mass communication has to make sure that they are um, equipping students to work on and advocate for diverse and inclusive teams. 
Ooh, that's the skill set we're talking about in managers doing evaluations. That's the skill set. And how do you not be fixated on, ooh, you're gay. Let me tell me about your partner. Like, you don't need (laughs) to lean. How do we prevent those microaggressions, those pitfalls that we tend to do? Because journalism and public relations, we tend to be very fast paced environments. Uh And we tend not to be very nice people when we are managing projects because we're on deadline and you got that wrong. And I don't know why you don't know how to use a comma versus a semicolon versus a period. And we tend to get a little bit of an attitude when we talk to each other because we're moving so fast. But an inclusive leader is going to have some filters. They're going to start thinking and processing about how this message might be received. How can I deal with conflict better? They're Mm -hmm. going to be better, more empathetic listeners. They are going to understand the business case of diversity. So when I need to hire someone, I'm not creating a job description that's so narrow that I have to find only this person who went to that school and graduated on that day. (laughs) You know, that's being facetious, but some of you look at some of our ads, that's what we're asking for is finding that needle in the haystack. Um, But now all schools that are credited have to produce students who can work on diverse and inclusive teams. And so that means that the faculty have to get it and have to learn how to do those skills themselves in terms of leading, managing, communicating, really appreciating the value, the business case for diversity and how do you implement it? Everything from vendor relationships, who are we getting as a caterer? Do we have a small disadvantage, you know, women own business strategies that we can get a diverse caterer or photographer or, or, or paper supplier or web designer, as well as recruiting and retaining talent, right? Or do we have programs that we're giving back to the communities that are diverse? Like we have to look at it as a 360 organizational approach to DEI, not simply, let me hire so-and-so as an intern. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And Ajana, you were, you were sharing with us some examples of how you convey and bring to life diversity, inclusion, and equality values in your agency. Does that reflect also in the work and the assessment that you provide for your clients, for the oh, yeah. clients? Well, so it's interesting because we actually have some energy right now because we have made some significant progress. We don't share our numbers publicly, but we are also okay. a diversity action alliance signatory. And I will just say things are looking good, okay. um, fingers crossed. But with that, um, as we staff accounts, and that's like what it's all about in the um, agency environment, as you know, like trying to figure out what's the right mix, who has the right background, who has the right interests. But we are challenging ourselves to really look at our team structures to say, what can we do so that we don't have any like homogeneous account teams ever? Oh. Like, and maybe it is like for folks who are like sort of marginally excited about healthcare, what can we be doing to get more BIPOC talent interested in, in healthcare? And so like having some initiatives with the practice group leads to say, doesn't look like y'all security, doesn't look like y'all have as much, you know, diversity as, as you probably want and as we for sure want. So what does that then look like for us to develop an action plan? What does that look like in terms of like, maybe doing some shadowing, maybe doing some breaking down the ins and outs of the industry so that within the scope of like our current talent pool, we are giving folks those opportunities. And then certainly as we um, recruit externally, it is bringing that awareness of how we have more meaningful partnerships with HBCUs, with Hispanic serving institutions, um, so that we kind of had that awareness. Now, one thing we did this year was we brought in HBCU um, alumni and experts um, to talk about HBCUs at, at High Wire, you know, and it was like all about HBCU magic. And it wasn't just like the history, but it was all about the cultural flavor. It was about the social capital that comes from HBCUs. It was about homecoming, sororities, fraternities, like so that people really have an understanding because we don't want to have an environment that doesn't match the aspirational expectations of folks who have been deemed and elevated in their lives, but then come to a workplace that doesn't like mirror that aspiration and mirror that like that cultural appreciation. So it's so important. And I, and, and I just think so many people were so grateful because again, I mean, you know, for all intents and purposes, HBCUs, like many other aspects of black culture really sort of 
rose to prominence post 2020. You know, Juneteenth rose to prominence post 2020. So it really does, it is incumbent upon us to break these things down for our colleagues so that they have that awareness. And so we don't just have people sort of saying in a very trans, you know, transactional way, like, oh, we need to have more HBCU partnerships without you really having an appreciation for what that looks like and the kinds of candidates who have had that experience and the expectations they have. So I just think um, exactly what we've been talking about, it's about the inside out approach. And it's really about bringing that equity lens to every facet of the business, 100%. Good. We are having a very interesting conversation, but it has to come to an end because I know that you have a time allotted for that. Final remarks, final comments in terms of recommendations to achieve a quantum leap in terms of progress. What should we do as the academy, the private sector, the NGOs, the society at large, the citizens to generate greater understanding, respect, appreciation for each other because at the end we're all, all humans it doesn't matter our the color of, of our skin the status of, of that we have in terms of education professionalism uh where we live what culture we are in so your final remarks in terms of that uh theme dr so, Ford first sure so one is is that diversity is not a US phenomena. It is a global phenomena. In every country, we have people who are from different skin tones, from different nations, from different ethnic groups, different gender identifications, sexual orientations, abilities, what have you. Diversity exists within every country. And so it is not a US-based phenomena. It might be um, race and racism may have an inflated, um, uh, I guess, uh, role in the United States because of our history of slavery. But the reality is colorism, ageism, et cetera, exists everywhere and we need to fight it. So it is a global phenomena that needs to be embraced celebrated and used for our, our, our business advantage, our relationship, our publics, um, uplifting publics that we are serving with the organizations we represent. The second thing is that inclusion without diversity makes diversity a failure. So you have to create an inclusive environment. But in order to create an inclusive environment, you have to be able to do incremental steps to make sure that people have access to your organization and not just equal opportunity, you know, but that recognizing that so, although there's an opportunity doesn't mean that everybody has, has access to um taking advantage of that or engaging in that opportunity. So equity is not just leveling the playing ground, but ensuring that the playing ground is open and accessible to people and that everybody is starting at different places with different access abilities, et cetera. Um, and so that we are, are creating pathways and those actionable, item, um, actionable um, steps to achieve inclusion and inclusion makes diversity the most amazing business imperative out there. But they have to work together. And it's not just a US thing, it's a global thing. I love that, I love that. Yeah, I think having that mindset of being a global citizen and, and to that end, what I think is like just critical is cultural humility, right? It's just like having such a deep appreciation. It's not even, I love cultural competence, but I love cultural humility even more mm -hmm. because that's essentially saying like you're deferring to your role as someone who's trying to appreciate the culture, trying to learn the culture, trying to ally with the culture. You will make mistakes along the way, right? And having that vulnerability, right? So 
Gladys, when I go to Puerto Rico and I've been a few times, right? I'm just like, bear with me, bear with me. This is a different <laughs> plantain. I'm like, normally I like my plantain sweet. These are not as sweet, but it's all good. I'm gonna try this plantain out. Like, I hope you, you have enjoyed Puerto Rico. I hope you have enjoyed your time in Puerto Rico. I love it. I love it. And so exactly what Dr. Ford said, like we bring that cultural humility when we're traveling, when we're like, we want to be honorable guests when we travel the world. But I love the sentiments she shared about bringing that same that energy, that vibrancy to the domestic work, right? So having that sense of cultural humility for me, I've worked in many multicultural populations. So bringing that awareness to learning about Dios de los Muertos and the traditions there, right? Like not knowing about marigolds and oranges and all of these things, right? But really just like being, partnering with great teachers and people who really honored me with like showing me all of these nuances of the culture. And it's the same in the workplace. It's the same in the workplace. And I think that that will go a long way around some of those tensions. If people can just step into that vulnerable space and just say, Hey, LGBTQ plus community, help me understand why a queer might come into play versus LGBTQ plus. What are the nuances there? Show me about cisgender, like show me, show me what with I should respect, be. Respect with respect. I want to respect the culture. Part. I want to respect the culture. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So it has been an honor having you today for this di diversity and dialogue session for the Global Alliance. We will be sharing it with all our councils and all our members, which are more than 300,000 uh, all over the world from different continents, different cultures, different languages. We celebrate them all because we are all worthy and valuable and we are all unique. And uh, it has been, oh my God, a dear, dear pleasure. And I thank you for allowing time and for saying yes. Once I contacted you, I feel that you're very close to my heart. And I feel like you're my friends and my, my I feel like uh, you're my mentor in, in this um, diversity and inclusion journey. So we hope to keep on learning, keep on uh, uh, the dialogue, the conversations, and uh, executing with uh, our mistakes and with our learning experiences to achieve progress. Mm -hmm. See you some other time and thank you so much. Thank you both. This was wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.